author. His name is Moacir Sklia. He's a contemporary author. He is um, just beginning to be well known and translated. <laughs> Uh, this the story. The, ori uh, the original was published in Brazil. The, the title is Notas ao Pé de Página, which means foot. It means footnotes, and it was published in 1995 in a collection of short stories. Since then, uh, a lot of his short stories have been translated into English, into French, um, and this is a very peculiar text if you have read it, or if you have seen it. Um, it's, well, uh, has everybody read it, or maybe the ones who got... And by the way, this is going to be totally interactive because I'm very tired. <laughs> and I, I will comment on the story with you. I have written about several stories um, that somehow talk about translation, or that have translators as characters. Everything started with Borges and Pierre Menard, as I've mentioned to you. I wrote my PhD dissertation on Borges, not about translation, but I, I, Pierre Menard was one of my favorite stories. And the, the first thing I ever published uh, was uh, something about Pierre Menard, and I've been talking about that ever since. <laughs> and I've looked for or I found other stories that discuss or deal with translation. Uh, I wrote something about this story, which has just come out uh, in a book collection published. Um, it, uh, somebody organized the collection, somebody from Valencia. It, his name is Jose Santa Emilia. And it's called, uh, the book is called uh, Gendered, uh, gen uh, Gender and Translation. It has just been published. Um, so, those of you who have read the story, what's the story about? Who's the narrator? Wait a minute. Who has read the story? <laughs> those are your victims. <laughs> okay, so here you have, well, this is the story. So we do not have the text. We just have footnotes. I mean, those of you who haven't read the story. We only have footnotes. And the text that the translator, the translator is the narrator. So the text that he, is, uh, that he has translated and to which he has, he has added five footnotes is invisible. So what's visible in the story, physically visible, I mean what's really visible here, are just the footnotes, five footnotes, translator's footnotes. And what do we learn from this translator? What is he talking about? Supposedly he's translating the diary of the author of the main text. Okay, who's a poet. So we know that he is translating the diaries of a poet who died. And so the invisible text is the diary. And what do we end up learning about the translator's relationship with the dead poet? He stole his, his girlfriend. <laughs> he not only stole his girlfriend, but he married her. Yes. <laughs> and his prestige, and maybe the text. He married maybe the text. <laughs> okay, so, well, um, so we have here, what do we have here? What, what is the plot then? Is he secondary in the story? No. Comes along, steals, uh, and 
basically takes the position. Yeah. So what does that remind you of? We have a love triangle. Yeah, well, uh, the, the relationship between translator and author is a relationship that is usually talked about in terms of some kind of competition. And the translator is usually the betrayer. I mean, it's the translator who somehow betrays the author. Uh, but here we have, and it's, I mean, when we really, when we usually talk about that relationship, if we are talking about a major poet, it's usually the translator who goes after the poet and tries to get his work or tries to, to translate his work. And here, this relationship is reversed. What happens here? It is the poet that bags the translator to, <laughs> to translate his work. It is somehow the poet who is after the translator's prestige. So all the relationships are somehow different here. Uh, the poet has a, a girlfriend, and it's only his mistress. Uh, and, the, and there is a, a suggestion here that the, um, the poet's mistress helps the translator also by being very friendly to the publisher. <laughs> In a way, it, it is the... the, the the mistress who gets him published by, well, it's not very clear, but it's, I think it's very suge it's suggested here. Um, and at the same time, the, the poet has a very informal relationship with his girlfriend. And then in the end, she marries the translator. So what can we do with that? Well, uh, maybe I should, um, I have, most of what I have written about this is very much influenced by uh, an essay that I mentioned to you this morning, uh, Laurie Chamberlain's um, The Metaphorics of Translation, The Gendering of Translation, in which she explores all these cliches about translation in terms of sexual roles. Uh, I, I've told you about the belle infidèle, the text, the woman <laughs> as text, that is, uh, if uh, she is beautiful, she is unfaithful, um, only the ugly text, just like the ugly woman, can be <laughs> faithful. So in a way, I, this, the secretary here would be playing that role. That is, she is, she's, she is the, the poet's mistress, but maybe she also goes out with the publisher, and then she also uh, sleeps with the translator. So in a way, she is a belle infidèle. Uh, so this, uh, something that we've been talking about, the woman as text, and the text, this is a postmodern story as well. So the woman as text, that is, unstable, uh, uh, but in the end, she marries the translator. What does that mean? What does marriage mean in that context? Even though that, that she, she can be very volatile, or very difficult to, to manage, the, the translator then gets associated with it very, very strongly and, and deeply. And, and then it's, not, it's very difficult to separate the words of the poet from that of the translator and the relationship they have with, with the woman in this case, but I, I would say with the text. Yeah, and the fact that they have a marriage, that is, they have a contract. So she belongs to the translator in a way by contract. So she cannot, I mean, she, we could say that she was unstable while, while she was only the poet's mistress, that is, the poet was not really able to control that, but it is to the translator that she finally gets uh, formally associated. And, well, uh, what I wrote about this story, I compare this to a very 
novel by Calvino. I don't know if you are familiar with that. If on a winter's night, a traveler, in which there is a translator who's also, uh, that translator uh, has a very interesting name. His name is Hermes Marana. And of course, Hermes, we can relate Hermes to the Greek god Hermes, uh, uh, which has been traditionally associated with tra translation interpretation. But Hermes is also the god that steals from other gods that which define them. Hermes is a mediator, uh, but he is a thief. He is a god that steals from other gods. So that translator is called Hermes Marana. And Marana is the name, I mean, it's Don Juan's name. The first Don Juan, the Don Juan el, el Burlador de Sevilla, that was his name, Don Juan de Marana. So our translator in Calvino's story is precisely Hermes Marana. And what does Hermes Marana do? He sleeps with all the women in the story. And that is what makes the author figure so angry in the story, because it is the translator that the reader, there is a, a character in the story. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that novel. Well, there is the reader, the female reader, who's the, the text in that, I mean, all the male characters want to possess her. She is the text. Um, the, the author figure is very, disturbed by the fact that it, it is the translator's word that she gets in touch with. And it is with the translator that she finally sleeps with. So this disturbs the author figure because, I mean, she is closely associated with the translator, not with the author. But, but she's a reader, not a text. Yeah, well, but she is the, the text in the sense that that's what they all want to somehow possess and control. In that sense, she's a metaphor for a text. And again, she is a belle infidel because she is, uh, she goes one way, then she goes another way until somebody finally marries her. And that's how the book ends. But she marries the male reader, not the translator. Now, in, in Sclear's story, she marries the translator. And the poet is dead. The author is dead. So I have read this story as a very interesting, um, somehow, um, all these cliches of postmodern theories. That is, we have the visible translator, something that we've been talking about. So the translator is visible. The author is dead. This is a, <laughs> this is a very recurrent uh, topic in post-structuralism. Uh, we talked about Nietzsche. Uh, Holland Barth has written about the death of the author. Foucault has written about the death of the author. So here the author is dead. And so the, the, um, the power is, all the power is given to the translator. The translator has prestige. It is the translator who marries the woman, the woman who cannot really control herself, but who gets, who becomes stable when she marries the translator. And it's, it is the translator that has all the prestige. I mean, it is, it's not the author. The author is dead again. And the author is a very weak figure. The translator is the strong figure because he is, he is the only voice we hear here. But when you read the story, do you sympathize with the translator? No. <laughs> Who do you sympathize with? <laughs> Not with a dead poet? No? <laughs> well, the woman has a very active role, but it, it, again, it's a very sexist role because she, she is only a secretary. And she is the one who helps the poet become a poet by being friendly with the editor. 
And then she's also friendly with the translator, and that's how the translator somehow accepts the job of translating the poet's, the weak author, <laughs> uh, the, the, the weak poet's uh, work. So she, it is a very sexist uh, role. She is active, but not as a writer, not as a translator. And she has no voice. In exactly. She has no voice. She sleeps around to help her men. That's what she does. <laughs> but she marries the translator. That, that is, the translator ends up possessing her. It is the translator and not the author who finally possesses her. That is, who finally takes over the text, in a way. But we do not sympathize with the, with the translator. Why not? Would, why, why, why do you think we don't? Is this translator properly visible? He's not only arrogant, but what else? Oh, the Greek god. In which way? Precise. Very, very good point, yes. He is a thief, in a way. And he shows that. How does he show that? Not just, I mean, not just from the plot, not just that we know that, well, uh, his wife used to be the, the author's mistress, but how does he show that? Are his footnotes appropriate? No. Why not? Pardon? Precisely. Very good point. That is, the kind of footnote that is, when we talk about translation, or it, let's say, if we, we, if we were translating something, when would we use translator's footnotes? If we were sensible and not postmodern. When there was something that we wanted to say in the text itself, but were unable to do so. Okay, so this is the space given to translators, that is footnotes, which we might say is a marginal space. If we compare, I mean, within the text, it's a marginal space. But translators, when they add footnotes, they are expected to be saying things that are somehow related to the text, uh, and that's the only space they have. They cannot take over the text. So what happens here? Not only, we do, I mean, we don't have the text, so he has not done his job in the way that he has not made the text, the author's text, the poet's text. He has not made the poet's text available to us. So we cannot, the visible translator here is the only one visible that is, he completely erased the author's voice. So he's completely inadequate in that sense. He didn't do his job. Not, not only that, but when he adds footnotes, which is the only thing we have access to, they have nothing to do with the text, but they have to do with the, maybe the behind the scenes of his personal relationship with the poet. So we have access to the kind of gossip that <laughs> went on in the margins of his professional relationship with the poet. So what would that be saying about the visible translator? What? Um, what would this be saying? I mean, the fact that this um, translator is so inadequately visible. Uh, 
that is, he turns his visibility into something so inappropriate, what would it be telling us about the translator's visibility, for instance? Pardon? Yes, that it's something very bad, because if the translator is visible, if this is the example we have, the author is erased. He's not only robbed of something that is very important to him, he is dead, and he is not visible. That is, I don't read him, but I read his translator's totally inappropriate text. So what would Moisty clear be telling us about translation. But if you can trust him as a, as a, as a person, you can trust the text he's producing. <coughs> exactly. So that's why I was saying to you before we started that in a way this is a parody or a very critical parody of what some people associate with postmodern theories of translation, that it would be totally inadequate, that the translator is o going overboard, that he's not doing his job, he is somehow uh, taking over a role that is not his, that he is in fact competing with the author and he is somehow um, taking the place of the author and that this is no good. Well, I'm not saying that I agree with that. <laughs> what I'm saying is that this is, in a way, a caricature of what a postmodern uh, translator could be compared to. But, but, but a caricature emphasizes something that exists. It doesn't turn it on its head. And that, you seem to be arguing, you know, this is anti-world. Well, what I... And I don't think that's true. Well, what I'm, what I'm saying is that, uh, well, again, I've compared this to Calvino's story. And if you... I mean, Calvino is also... Uh, his novel, the one that we've talked about, is, again, uh, full of post-structuralist cliches. I mean, uh, if you have read Foucault, if you have had Roland Barthes, all that is somehow turned into fiction in Calvino's um, novel. And Calvino was, in fact, very a friend of some of those uh, post-structuralist uh, writers, uh, Foucault himself. But Calvino is somehow, if you read what Calvino has to say about his own translators, it's very interesting. He didn't like them, and he didn't like to be translated. So in a way, uh, he creates a character in which translation is associated with, um, I mean, uh, Hermes Manana. That is, it's someone that you cannot trust, is a betrayer um, in all kinds of aspects. I mean, he, uh, he cannot be trusted. He mixes texts around. He has no ethics. He has no personal ethics. He is a Don Juan. Uh, he's a, a thief, and in a way, we have a similar translator here. We have a translator who has no ethics, and that is somehow associated with these uh, postmodern cliches. That is, the visibility of the translator, the reader takes over, uh, the role, uh, the pa I mean, the the role uh, reading becomes the true form of of authorship. The author is dead and the notion of the author being dead, which is probably one of the strongest or one of the most recurrent motifs in post-structuralism. Mm 